And now today's afternoon drama, a contemporary thriller set in and around Glasgow. And it features the first in a series of investigations for a detective with a highly unusual gift. The Sensitive by Alistair Jessamon It's the details, the lovely details that give meaning to life, that sustain you. A passage in a favourite piece of music, the play of sunlight on the surface of a river, the particular way somebody smiles. But most of the time, those details are obscured by the information. They'll find us. Shh. You're safe now. Safe with me. In fact, she was to become Jack the Ripper's next victim. At around 5.30 a.m. on the morning of September 8th, a neighbour reported hearing a commotion, with a woman's voice crying, no, and then the sound of someone falling against a fence. Oh, I was listening to that. I am trying to concentrate, Mum. It drowned out the drill. Thought you might be interested. Yeah, well, I'm not. It's a series. Next week, it's the Yorkshire Ripper. Look, let's just play, Mum, shall we? Unbelievable. Height of the season. Why can't they do the roadworks in the winter? There are five guest houses in this street, for goodness sake. Will you stop worrying about it? Well, I am worried, Thomas. Know how many bookings I've had for August? Two. Uncanny. I don't understand it either. <sighs> Clyde Coast used to be so popular. It's Uncanny. It's not... All consonants. Ugh. I'm just going to have to put... Blob. Blob? And that's it? That's all I can do. University education, and all I can put is a blob. <laughs> I've got a missing persons tomorrow. Have you? <laughs> Should be sending a car about nine. Oh, I hope Sergeant Taylor has time for a cup of tea. Sergeant Taylor's just retired, actually. Oh, I like Sergeant Taylor. Who's your new person? I don't know. <laughs> Zambuck. There is no such word. A triple word score. Oh, goodness, that's it. <laughs> There's no such word as Zambuck. Yes, there is. Okay, what does it mean then? Oh, I don't I just know there's such a word. Look it up in the dictionary. Yeah, I certainly will. You are not getting away with Zambuck. Who's missing? I don't know the details, Mum. I'll find out tomorrow. Uh, Zambuck. Zambuck. I told you. A first aid attendant at a sports event. Oh, fancy. Oh. I wish that drill would shut up. Are you getting one of your headaches, dear? I think you're too hot. You should take your coat off in the house. I'm cold. This is July. How can I'm you cold, be? Mum. I'm very fond of my coat. A second skin. Gives me that added bit of protection from the information from other people. Take your coat off if you like, Mr. Souter. No, I'm fine, thanks. Must say, it's a bit of a privilege, actually. Some of the others, you know, my colleagues, all mumbo-jumbo to them. Not, not to Sergeant Taylor or the boss. Don't indicate, will you? <sighs> Sorry. No, boss says to me the other day, you can't argue with results. Moron! <sighs> Sorry. No. My aunt was a bit psychic, actually. Said she always knew who it was when the phone rang. You know, before she answered it, mind you, it was generally only me and my mum that phoned her. Sorry, I'm rabbiting. Uh, tell me about this girl. Aye, sorry. Her name's Lisa McLean. She went missing about six months ago. Left for work one morning, didn't turn up and hasn't been seen since. And we've drawn a total blank. And the man we're going to see, the boyfriend? 
Callum Gold. Strange bloke. Not very helpful. Surprised he's agreed to this, to be honest. And she didn't say anything to you about meeting anybody? No, she didn't. Did you part on good terms that morning, Mr Gold? No. We had an argument. I've told you all this. Why do I have to keep going over it? Really just to fill Mr Souter in. Huh. Good to have a bit of background, isn't it, sir? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I, I was just admiring your CD collection, Mr Gold. You seem to be a man of impeccable taste. Is that right? Thomas Tallis, Gregorian Chant, Robert Carver. You like sacred music? Sacred music is a great passion of mine. I love Carver particularly. He was a genius. Early 16th century, Sharon. Oh, right. Greatest Scottish composer there's ever been. Uh-huh. Although, Lisa didn't think so. No. That's what her argument was about that morning. My choice of music over breakfast. Developed into a full-scale battle. She stormed out. Last time I ever saw her. What time was this again? I've told you what time this was. I, I don't want to... Keep... Tell me about Lisa, Mr Gould. What do you want to know? <laughs> What's she like? Well, Lisa's very practical. Good with money and... Well, I am not She was the breadwinner. Worked in a cafe. That's right. I played jazz piano in pubs now and then for a few bob, but basically Lisa supported us. While I stayed here and wrote my music. And was that a bone of contention? Yes. It wasn't just that I wasn't making money... It was the kind of music I was writing. Which was? Sacred music. You said sacred music was your passion, Mr Souter. That's right. So perhaps you'll understand. It's very much my passion too. You see, I was brought up in a very dour Protestant household, Mr Souter. My parents were religious fanatics from another century. They disapproved of music. And when I heard this music for the first time, this music full of joy, glorifying God, this was what I wanted to do with my life, to glorify God. Lisa could never understand that. When we argued that morning, she kept on about how I was wasting my life, rubbishing my music, and I just couldn't stand it. I just snapped, you see. Go on. I said these terrible... these terrible, cruel things... till she walked out. Whatever's happened to her, I'm responsible. She, she just couldn't see how important my music... Shut up! Turn the bloody noise down! Sorry. It's like living next to the Simpsons. Shouldn't let it get to me, but it does. You know what this estate is called? The Cullen Estate. Profoundly ironic. Used to be able to see the Cullens from my bedroom window. Strange how ugly your life can become. Sorry. She's dead, you know. We don't know that, Mr Gold. No. No, we don't. Can you find her? I can try. How do we go about this? Well, what I do is I take a couple of things that belong to Lisa. An item of clothing, whatever. And I just see if I get a, a sense of her, some kind of clue as to where she might be from her belongings. Aye. Go ahead. Do what you have to do. An item of clothing. There, there's her cardigan here. Ah, and uh, a couple of other things that uh, she was fond of. Uh, her watch. She left her watch behind that morning. It's just over on the sideboard. Uh, her pendant's here too. Fine. 
So, what I do, Mr. Gold, Callum, is simply put my hands on her things and concentrate. Mr. Suter, are you all right? Oh, what happened? Oh, sorry. I just need a minute. I don't know what happened. Sometimes takes a while to understand. You think she's dead, don't you? I can tell. I don't from know. Me. I don't know, really. Look, I will be in touch, Callum. I promise. Here, this is my card. If you want to contact me. Yes. Right. Thank you. Find her, Mr. Souter. Thomas. I want it to be over, Thomas. I'm tired. Cheers. Cheers. <sighs> Better make this my last. Goes to my head. Hope I didn't act out of turn, giving the man my card. I felt sorry for him, I suppose. Anyway, a bit of a tradition, this. Sergeant Taylor always used to take me for a drink afterwards. You all right? Aye, aye. Just takes a bit of time to regroup, to return to normal. So tell me, Mr. Souter. Yeah, Thomas. Thomas, what happened? I mean, when you put your hand on our cardigan, you went as white as a sheet. Aye. Did you have a sense she might be dead? Well, a, a sense, yes, but... You see, these things... It was just a sense. And I never altogether trust the information. It likes to play games with you. The information? Aye. All the stuff that comes at you. Impressions, sounds, images that might add up to something. Or not. I know this must sound a bit odd. No, it... It's fascinating. It's difficult to describe the process. Aye. You think you might have killed her? I don't know. I found him very difficult to read. But some people are like that. Opaque. I did have a sense he was hiding something. So, what happens now? I spend the evening in my room with her cardigan and whatnot, with my various bits and pieces. Bits and pieces? Aye. I see if anything happens. And if anything happens, I phone you. Right. Uh, I did say it's difficult to describe. No, no, it, it's amazing. It's an amazing gift you have. A gift? Well, isn't it? So that evening, I put some music on my stereo, put the young woman's cardigan around my shoulders, her watch on my wrist, her chain around my neck. I spread my map of Glasgow and the Clyde Estuary in front of me, let my pendulum hover over it, and waited. For it. Eh? Aye. You've worked with Thomas quite a few times, have you, Mr. Duncan? Oh, aye. Mr. Souter always calls at me when he wants to go down the water. And is this a full time job? <laughs> Good God. No, Anne. Luckily, there's not that many corpses in the Clyde. Aye, Christmas tends to be the busy time of year. And nice sunny spells like this brings out the suicides for some reason. You'd think most people would want to kill themselves in November, February, you know? Grey, drich days and nothing on the telly. 
But no, Christmas and sunny spells. Is it mainly suicides? Uh, uh, a lot of suicides. A fair amount of accidents. Drunks, you know. One or two murders. What are they doing here? Yeah. Oh, they're dredging this part of the river. I've been working up here for a while now. You all right, Thomas? Best to leave him alone, dear, you know. He needs to concentrate. That's why I use the rowing boat and know the launch. He likes quiet. Ah, she's close. They'll find us. Shh. We're safe now. Safe with me. A lot of the bodies are never identified. I, yeah, but for the grace of God, uh, she's here. Huh? Sorry, Mr. Suda. Over there. By that old boathouse. Mr. Duncan. Huh? Can you take us over, over there? Huh? But that dilapidated. Yes. Yes. She's under. Under there. Under the boathouse? Yes. Look. What is it? I can't see anything. Next to that wooden support. It's her hair. It kept me awake at night. The image of her hair floating on the surface of the river. The dead can hang around. They can get under your skin. Hello? Evening, Thomas. It's DC Webb. Oh, Sharon. A bit of news for you. Callum Gold. We're pretty sure he's done a runner. Couldn't get hold of him to identify the body. Seems he's not been in his flat for days. Right. But we've got a positive ID now. It's her, all right. Lisa McLean. Seems pretty certain she was killed with a single blow to the head. One interesting thing. She was tied under the boathouse with climbing rope. Remember Callum's place? Yes. The climbing gear in the living room. Exactly. The boss is impressed, Thomas. And, you know, Wilson, McNabb, that lot. Gobsmack. Sick as pigs. You can't argue with the results. Where are you, by the way? In, in the bath, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's I'll it. I'll leave you in peace. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> Cheers, Sharon. Oh, morning. Uh, morning, Thomas. Good morning, dear. Uh, Thomas, this is Mrs. Allsop. I invited her to take breakfast with us, since she's our only guest. I hope you don't mind. Uh, not at all. Uh, Very nice to meet you. You all right, dear? You look a bit peely, Wally. Oh, I've not been sleeping too well. Why is that? Mum, do you think we can turn that music down? I mean, I'm sure Mrs. Allsop doesn't want to have accordion music with her breakfast. Do you mind the music, Mrs. Allsop? Not at all. Very cheery. The guests like something cheery in the morning, I find. If Thomas had his way, we'd have that Italian chap for breakfast all the time. Pavarotti? Mantovani. No, Monteverdi. Aye. He goes into his wee room and writes away and listens to him for hours. Religious music, all in Latin. Oh, more tea, Mrs. Also. Oh, thanks, dear. Is uh, writing your line of work then, Thomas? <coughs> well, now, God has given Thomas a rather unusual gift, Mrs. Also. Thomas is what is called a sensitive. That is, he has psychic powers. Oh, goodness me. <clears throat> Mum. He's written quite a few books on the subject. 
He's even appeared on TV on a series they had in BBC Scotland, The, the, the Mysteries of the Brain. The, the Mysteries of the Mind. Mum, can you pass the marmalade, please? And he assists in missing people investigations and murder investigations. Oh, goodness. So are you working on a case at the moment, Thomas? Well, it's all a bit hush-hush, I'm afraid, Mrs. Also. Ah. He's not allowed to talk about things. As you can imagine, the Strathclyde police are very reluctant to admit that they employ someone with paranormal powers. <laughs> And it means that Thomas's work goes largely unapplauded. Must be fascinating, though. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Mrs. Souter, I wonder if I might prevail on you for some more cereal. Of course. Now, let no, me... no, 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 I'll go. <laughs> I need to keep exercising the old pins. Oh, Awful nice lady. Mm -hmm. What's that meant to mean? Just a hunch. Oh. Don't trust her eyes. Difficult to read. I'd keep counting the spoons if I were you. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to get the nine o'clock ferry, Mama. I don't know if I'll be back for dinner. Where are you going? Glasgow. To see that <laughs> exhibition I saw last month. The one I was telling you about, the bizarre slot machines. Why do you want to go back so soon? Just a hunch. You and your hunches... On bad days, in the city, you're an aerial, picking up every mean and petty thought. You're a magnet for all the grey, drunken ghosts and spirits who cling to your cuffs and demand your money. But on good days, when the sun comes out and the psychic static dies down, the traffic can begin to sound like music, and the information seems to offer connections, connections between people and things and nature that seem, I don't know, beautiful. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Big bad wolf, big bad wolf. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? La 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, eh? Uh, yes, yes. It gives people a laugh. Interactive. Good for the kids. I think I'd have been terrified of this as a kid. Little Red Riding Hood getting scoffed by the wolf. <laughs> Seemingly in one version of the story she was scoffed. Is that right? Hmm? Well, uh, they're beautifully put together. Yeah. My favourite's the babes in the wood. The birds covering the two wee kids with leaves. Aye. Aye, yeah, it's lovely, that one. There was another thing in here the last time. Uh, a pianist being tortured by little red devils with cattle prods. And, and it was raining burning books. Oh, right. Tortured artist is called. Over here. Oh, in the alcove. Thanks. Oh, yeah. You seem to be out of change. Let me. The details that I love. The hair falling over his face. Beads of sweat on his forehead. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the woman who made them? Gold. Very gold. I've got a leaflet here. Ah, oh, thanks. Aye, gold. Is she from Glasgow, do you know? Yes. Teaches at the art school. Got a big studio above the Ajanta restaurant. I better just tell you, I'm not exactly official. Sorry, what do you mean? I help with missing persons, but I'm not actually a policeman. I've been helping the police with their inquiries. You're the psychic? The sensitive, yes. The what? The sensitive. Sorry, it's just the term I prefer to use. Oh, yes. Uh, sit, sit down. Oh, thank you. Could I ask when you last saw your brother? About a week ago. Was he all right? Of course he wasn't all right. Callum, oh, damn Callum. 
I'm sorry. Would you like a drink? I'm sorry. No, no thanks. You don't mind if I... I can't help you. I don't know where he is. We argued. He stormed out. He could be anywhere. He could have blown his brains out. Oh, shit. Sorry. You had an argument? Aye. He was sure the police would think he'd killed Lisa. He wanted to hide. Told him not to be so stupid. Told him he had nothing to be afraid of because he didn't do this to Lisa. You, you believe that? Oh, I don't know. Lisa was the kind of woman who made plenty enemies. Plenty. Like all Callum's girlfriends. She was trouble. Oh, they were all trouble. And he always came back to me when it didn't work out. Oh, Lisa. God. That poor lassie. It was you who found her. Yes. You've got to find Callum. When he gets like this, he, he could harm himself. Have you any idea where he might be? No. He said he was going to go back to Skye. Skye? Back to her pains in Skye. But you didn't believe that? No. No, we haven't seen them for over 20 years. They could both be dead for all I know. Callum mentioned them. I had a sense he didn't get on with them. Oh, you could say that. They were vicious. Made her life's hell. Callum's especially. They were religious, he said? Oh, religious maniacs. We ran away when we were kids. Ran away, came to the city, changed our names. They never found us. No. No, he wouldn't have gone back to them. But then, where would he go? Oh, God. Vary, I'll need to mention you to the police. They'll want to ask you some questions. How, how did you find me? Callum wouldn't have told you about me. I went to your exhibition about a month ago. I remember the piano player, the sculpture. Something clicked. It was Callum, wasn't it, the, the piano player? Aye, it was Callum. He talked about you. I think he trusted you. Please, find him and tell him he has nothing to worry about. He's nothing to worry about, has he? Oh. I mean, I let him down. He came to me for help and we only have one another, so you will find him. Please. Passionate, pleading eyes. I began to see the whole story reflected there in Vary's eyes. They'll find us. Shh. You're safe now. Safe with me. Hello. Hello, Thomas, dear. Your dinner's in the fridge. You, you want me to microwave it well, for I'll you? I'll do it, Mum. Good evening, Mrs Allsop. Evening, dear. Now, you're a guest, Mrs Allsop. You really don't need to wash up. I enjoy it, love. Big drama today, Thomas. Oh? Oh, this young chap turned up at the door in a dreadful state. Oh, he was in a dreadful state, wasn't he, Mrs. Also? Uh, said he knew you. Well, I, I couldn't turn him away. I gave him a room. I hope that was all right. What's his name? I hardly spoke to him, dear. Mrs. Also took charge. Whisked him off for a, a walk almost as soon as he got here. He just needed to talk to somebody. Mrs. also has been marvellous. Uh -huh. Callum, his name is... I don't know his second name. Do you know him, Thomas? Yes. How do you He's know a friend him? of a friend. What was he saying, Mrs. Olsop? Well, he talked about his girlfriend who who died or something. I, I couldn't quite understand. He, he was in tears a lot of the time. He seemed to be on the verge of a breakdown, to be honest. Is he in his room? He's out for the count, love. Fast asleep. Oh. And never seen anyone look so exhausted, Thomas. And uh, he left you a, a little note. Oh, I've got it here. Is he in trouble? Thomas, I will talk to you in the morning. Please don't call the police until I confess to you all. 
I stood outside his bedroom, staring at the note. Something wasn't right. I opened his door and tiptoed in. I could hear the gentle rhythm of his breathing. Mr. Suit. Oh, Mrs. Olsop, you startled me. Now, don't wake him, will you? Uh, poor chap needs his sleep. I couldn't sleep. I put on some music to try and help me relax, took a couple of sleeping pills and tried to ignore the information, which was telling me that something was very wrong. Fari, she has found me. My parents were religious fanatics. Uh, no. They disapproved uh, of music. <laughs> I woke from a nightmare. I'd fallen asleep with the music on, but it wasn't the music that had woken me up. It was something else. And then... What's wrong? It's Gallo. It's Gallo. He's in there. He's in there. Mrs. Also, what's happened? Back there in the room. God help you. God help us. His skull had been crushed by the clock in his room. I didn't understand it. I just saw Vary Gold curled up outside my door whimpering, her face and hands covered in blood. Mrs. Olsop like a figure out of Greek tragedy, her eyes staring strangely, pointing down the hall towards Callum's room. And I could hear the information, mocking me. Isn't it obvious what happened, it was saying. Didn't you read it in their eyes? You could have saved him, it was saying. Why didn't you save him? She hasn't spoken a word since we took her in, Thomas. Not even sure if she can hear us. Vary, it's Mr. Souter to see you. Can you talk to Mr. Souter, Vary? Hello, Vary. Do you think you could tell us what happened? I know it's difficult, Vary, but... Do you think you could do that? What happened, Vary? Callum. Yeah, what about Callum? Vary. Callum. Callum. It was all she could say. The fire had gone from her eyes. She kept repeating his name, staring at me her eyes cold and empty. I wanted to believe that she couldn't have killed her brother. But the information was telling me otherwise. Vary, she has found me. But it can fool you. The information. It can mock you. Mislead. They offered me counselling, Thomas. Did you take it? I did not. Oh, dear, that poor boy. Yes. What possessed the girl? We don't know what happened yet, Mum. I never thought I'd be having my dinner in the Caledonian. It's soulless. And the linen is damp. Oh, I don't know. Police crawling all over my house, turning everything over. Look, it's only for a couple of days. Aye. Poor Mrs. Allsop. Brought her up a cup of tea an hour ago and she could hardly speak. 
police in and out of her room. I, I wish they'd just leave her alone. Did she ever tell you where she was from? Yes, she did. She's, She's from Sky. How did you know that? Oh, yes. Her husband was from Skye, but they met in London. <sighs> After they were married, they moved back up. Fari, she has found me. Profoundly ironic. Used to be able to see the coolings from my bedroom window. Don't trust her eyes. Difficult to read. Thomas? Hmm? Thomas, are you all right? Yes, look, Mum, I am just going to have a quick word with Mrs. Also. Oh, we're in the middle of our dinner. Oh, don't disturb her, dear. Mrs. Also, can I come in? Can I come in? Sit down. I'm very sorry, Mr. Souter. You and your mother have shown me nothing but kindness. I'm so sorry you've both been subjected to all this. Put to such inconvenience. The young girl, do you know how she... how she is? She's very disturbed. Yes. Has she told them what happened? No. No, not yet. I suppose they presume she killed him. I suppose they do. Do you believe that she killed him, Mr. Souter? No. I believe that you killed him. And do you know why? Yes. Yes, I think I do. Tell me. It was God who told me what to do. It was a terrible thing I did. My own son. But there was no choice. I couldn't disobey God, could I? Callum phoned me after he'd met you. First time I'd heard from him in 25 years. He didn't even know his father had died. His own father. Can you imagine that? Why did he phone you? He told me that he'd killed a woman and hidden her body. The woman he'd been living with. He asked me to hide him. He'd murdered her. He said it was an accident. They'd had an argument, he'd hit her and she'd struck her head on the table, but I didn't believe him. He phoned me up out of the blue, crying like a child. And he asked me to hide him, a murderer, my son. We always knew that he, that he was capable of such evil. I told him, I will not harbour you. Oh, no. You'll confess to what you've done. Well, eventually, yes, he said he'd talk to the police. But he said he wanted to talk to you first. He gave me your address, and then... God told me what to do. And Vari? I persuaded him to go to bed, talk to you in the morning, write you a note. I told him it would be a cleansing ritual. A purification before God to confess to yourself and to me and to his sister. We phoned her, told her to come immediately. I let her in and told her to go and see her brother. By that time, her brother was dead. Oh, you... You think that was cruel, Mr. Souter, I can tell. And yes, yes, there was a moment, I confess, when I, when I saw her walking down the corridor to his room, I weakened, 
I almost called out to her not to go in there. Vari! I hadn't seen my little girl for 25 years. But one must harden one's heart. To be rejected in that way by your own children. Didn't even know their own father had died. They were evil, you see. I was merely God's instrument. God asked me to... to do what I did. One must follow God's dictates. And yet... one might wonder, Mr. Souter, as Abraham with Isaac... Why did God not stay my hand? I went to see Vari every weekend for a year. She was on very heavy medication and at first I wasn't even sure she recognized me. But very slowly she began to respond. Just a few words initially. Then conversations. One Saturday morning I came into the ward and she was sitting at a table fashioning these little boats out of card. She smiled when she saw me. Suggested we went into the grounds and sail her boats. I like to think he didn't mean to kill her. Well, that is what he told your mother. Oh, I'll miss him so much. Take my arm, Thomas. It's been very good of you to come so regularly. It's been no trouble. <laughs> well... I'm going to discharge myself next week. Really? Yes. Are you going back to work? Bit of teaching at the art school, if they'll take me. Your sculptures? Perhaps I'll get back to them. In time. River's very lovely today. Mm. Look at that patch of sunlight. Come on, Thomas. Take a boat and we'll have a race. <laughs> We let them go by the edge of the river and watched them being taken downstream. For a moment, it seemed as if they might sink, but then they recovered, caught on an eddy, swirled around and then shot down the river and out of view. It's the details, the lovely details that give meaning to life, that sustain you. A passage in a favourite piece of music. The play of sunlight on the surface of a river. The particular way that somebody smiles. In The Sensitive by Alistair Jessamon, Thomas was played by Jimmy Chisholm, Sharon by Julie Austin, Mrs. Alsop, Mary Riggins, Mrs. Souter, Sheila Donald, Vary, Catherine Howden, Callum, Chris Young, and Duncan and Attendant by James Bryce. The director was Bruce Young. <laughs>